White comfort trumps black liberation. White comfort trumps black freedom. White comfort trumps black joy. White comfort trumps. If that is not addressed, it will slide in and be behind the scenes and you won't even know it's there. America has seen black trauma play out for years. If you want to survive, do and say as little as possible. Through movies about slavery and racial terror in all its forms. And even more viscerally in real life, with every case of police harassment and violence against black people. After George Floyd's murder at the hands of police, the country finally started waking up to systemic racism and the silent trauma it inflicts. We need justice right now! There's growing research into racism's real impact on the body, especially how stress can impact health and how your DNA works. Resma Menikam, a therapist and trauma specialist, has been drawing on this research for years. In the months following Floyd's death, his 2017 book about racialized trauma made it to the New York Times bestseller list. We checked in with him in May. So your a therapist and racial trauma expert, if you could define what racial trauma is. Yeah. So for me, racial trauma is number one, um, the idea that the white body is the supreme standard of humanness. Me and you were born into a structure by which the white body deemed it, it deems itself and deemed itself the human standard, right? And, 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 and we were considered to be the deviants from that hum, human standard. And so the trauma element um, is that uh, it is unceasing, it is pervasive, it is persistent, right? And it is woven in and around and through every institution, along with something not reparative. So it's not just that something bad happened to you, it's that something bad happened to you and there was no... Um, there was no reprieve. You talk about in your book that white supremacy literally, not just figuratively, lives in our blood, our DNA expression, our nervous system. Absolutely. Can you break Absolutely. down what that actually means? Yeah. I come from a people that were brutalized, raped, could not run, could not flee, terrorized, their towns burned up, uh, girls uh, blown up in the church, right? All of that stuff for 250 years was happening to me or to my people. When, when somebody is brutalized, there are particular things that happen to the nervous system. One of them is that there is a release of adrenaline. There's a release of cortisol. There's a release of uh, norepinephrine. And those things are designed to get you out of danger or help you fight or flee out of danger. And, 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 and those things are only supposed to be in your nervous system for short bursts of time. But what if the thing that is that is dangerous doesn't leave for 250 years? What happens to all of that adrenaline? What happens to all of that cortisol? What does it do to the DNA expression? One of the things about DNA expression is it's designed to turn things on and off on the DNA. There is a certain kind of thing that makes that DNA say, be hypervigilant. Well, you know, look for things. You know, uh, the, the, this place is dangerous. Don't look white people in the eyes but it's unspoken. We have it We have it in our bodies as notions. So imagine that going down just from one line all the way down and by the time it gets to me and you, we have this sense that something is off. We have this vibratory sense and we don't, we don't have a language for it. Time decontextualizes trauma, right? So trauma in a person looks like personality, can look like personality over time. Trauma in a family can look like family traits over time. Trauma in a people can look like culture over time. You know, what are some examples Absolutely. of culture? So my grandmother used to have a, a braided switch, right? That was braided and put behind uh, her, her and my grandfather's picture. And every time you look up, you see that switch, right? If we got out of line, right? My grandmother would, would, uh, would whoop us, right? You know, get your butt back in line, whoop us. Well, think about 250 years of whippings, of rearing, of, of brutality 
on the black body. I believe that whoopings is a traumatic retention from whipping. These are the things that we have to examine, right? And, and the same thing happens for white folks, right? White folks have never examined the thousand years of brutality that they experienced at the hands of other white folks through the Middle Ages, through through a thousand years of that, that Euro violence. And then that body came here, <laughs> right? Without any reprieve, without anything. And so by the time elite white bodies offered poor white bodies whiteness they by the time they were offered the idea of not being servants not being um and, and they were still were but 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 there was another level that was put in there and that level was above uh africans by the time they were offered it they took it because they understood what the brutality was like at the hands of elite white bodies they don't have a collective way of getting at that violence you talk about how that there's a perception that whiteness is working out for white people, but yeah. it isn't. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, the reason why I say it's not working out for white people is that it, the, for white people to participate in the structure like this means that they must uh, give up part of their humanity to, 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 to participate. They get advantages, right? Uh, economic advantage, advantages, split second advantages. They know that if they move against the structure as it currently exists, that they will lose things. They understand that they will lose relationships. They will lose access. They will lose um, things that, uh, that have to be given up in order to destroy and dismantle um, this, the, the system, the white body supremacist system as it currently exists. White bodies have to begin to do the work among other white bodies to reclaim their humanity, right? Um, to begin to look at this as a structural issue. When we look at how you connect white supremacy and neuroscience, um, I think yeah. it'd be really helpful to just kind of hear you talk through what the yeah. soul nerve is, as you call it. There is a, um, a, a nerve that comes out of the brainstem and it hits in the pharynx, pieces of it hit in the face, it hits in the chest, it hits in the belly, it goes all, it's, it's called the vagal nerve or the vagus nerve. The vagal nerve is responsible for helping you notice environmental vibrations, what what's potentially dangerous, right? And so this is why we have uh, things like gut reactions to something. You meet somebody and you go, I don't quite know about that person, but something's telling me, ah, right? You don't really have the words to describe what it is, but you know you're picking up on something. How does it explain police interactions? There's this idea, uh, one idea out here called triune brain. And the triune brain is the neocortex, the mammalian part of the brain, and then the lizard brain. The lizard brain is actually one of the oldest parts of the brain that was mo mostly tied to our survival. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, those types of things. When an officer comes upon a black body, there are these things that light up in the lizard brain that are about fight, flight, freeze, fawn. One of the things that can happen is that the vagal nerve can constrict and protect and people will feel a visceral experience of bracing. And then they come out of a society that, that in which they have been conditioned to see the black body as impervious to pain, right? The black body that must be subdued with extraordinary amount of force because their bodies are different and they are different and they are, and they will destroy you if you don't um, take uh, uh, um, um, some type of lethal uh, stance. And, and many times that bracing goes unexamined throughout the course of people's lives, but it also goes unexamined throughout the course of, of police officers being trained. And so you've consulted with police departments. What kind of reaction yeah, do you get when I, you talk to them about white body supremacy? They don't really like it because because they, they think that is all they have to do is tweak around the edges, right? They don't believe that there's this that this is a this is structural, not episodic. There is a commitment that many police departments don't want to make, right? And and that is that 
a lifetime commitment towards uprooting white body supremacy, right? Uh, a lifetime commitment towards helping police officers understand their own bodies and how they have been conditioned by a structure that, that and by which the white body has deemed itself the supreme standard, regardless of what color those police officers are. As far as healing work, where does one even begin? How can a black person start to heal racial trauma? Right. One of the first things that we have to do is we have to acknowledge that something has happened and continues to happen to us, right? And it's not a figment of, of our imagination. One of the things I say to black bodies all the time is you are not defective. You're not defective. The system and the structure would have you believe that you're fraudulent and you're an imposter and because you don't quite measure up to the white body standard, right? In a myriad of different ways. And so healing really does involve reclaiming pieces that uh, that were um, put aside in order to survive what it is that we're dealing with right now. And so uh, for me, it's it, it really does, it's about how do we turn towards each other as opposed to turning on each other. Is it possible to heal racial trauma if you're still in that same environment that is trauma-inducing? I'm not sure we're going to get to a place to where um, the impact of white body supremacy is alleviated, it's gone, right? I think, though, in the meantime, we have to continue to work towards healing. Right. We have to continue because the alternative is to accept what it is and um, and not fight and not cre try and create a world that is more responsive to what black bodies and, and brown bodies need. Right. And so one of the most beautiful things is this group uh, down in uh, Atlanta and they have what they call a nap ministry. Right. It's called the NAP Ministries. And basically what they're doing is, is and it's revel it really is revolutionary. What they're what they're actually saying is that black bodies should rest. Now, that may say it sound like, oh, that's not a big deal. Napping what's napping, but napping to a to a people who have been taught to override um, any rest, any sense of themselves. Right. Is a huge philosophical thing. And it can shift a whole structure. Those are the pieces of, of, of reclamation. So I believe we can do that at the same time that we're moving towards uh, uh, and doing things to actually dismantle and abolish this structure as it currently stands.